episode 122 of Talk Town State is underway. Jam packed show yet again. In the last two episodes, we've spoken with six Mouse D's conference coaches. That's half the conference. Let's start getting into the latter half of the conference as well. And we are pleased to be joined to kick off part three of our MEC preview series with head coach Brian Poor, friend of this program, and the men's head basketball coach at West Virginia State. He's actually entering, not to make him feel old, entering his 24th <laughs> year as the Yellow Jackets head coach. So, Coach Poor, welcome back to the program. Hey, thanks. It's always good to be back. You know, up at the, the media day there the other day, I was called um, the dean of the coaches and uh, the veteran coach. And so, basically, I'm the old guy. Um, but that's that's all good. That means I've been here for a while. Hey, but here's the thing. I'm not trying to pat you on the back or anything, but you don't look old whatsoever. Just saying. Well, I appreciate that. Um, the gray hair kind of gives it away a little bit. And, you know, when I became a head coach, I had dark hair uh, and I wore glasses. So I tell everybody I'm kind of a freak of nature because my eyes got better and then my hair turned gray. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to mention the hair part, <laughs> but since you did, you, that you addressed the elephant in the room. So, OK, yeah, the hair gives it away. <laughs> 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 okay, well, let's start there. I mean, you, you, you've been around the game for a long time. You've been the head coach now for 24 years at West Virginia State. What, is, what has his career been like for you at State? You've, uh, you've accumulated over 370 wins as the Yellow Jackets head coach. Just walk me through what, these, what your whole tenure has been like for you. Oh, shoot. You know, it's, it's, it's been a ride, that's for sure. Um, and, you know, when, uh, when they um, did the interview, our, our our president, Dr. Carter, at the time, uh, asked me, you know, what do you see? How do you see the program in five years? And I said, well, we will have won our first championship and we'll be in our new building. Now, we did win our first championship in year number four, uh, but we didn't get in the new building until, what, 2017. So it took us a little while to do that. Um but, you know, it, it's been, um, you know, we skyrocketed to the top and held the, 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 the top of the league for several years. Um, then had some injury issues and some chemistry issues and kind of, you know, dropped down a little bit. But, but now we've, we've climbed back up there. And, and, you know, I think we're securely in the top four in the league. And, um, you know, one of the three teams that got into the NCAA tournament last year. So, you know, we've climbed back up. So it, it was a bit of a struggle to get that climb back up. Um, but now I think we're there, uh, and we're really looking forward to this season as well. You were a coach – whenever you were coaching West Virginia State, I should say, they were in the WBIAC, and then now it's better known as the Mountain East Conference. So you've been able to see it from both sides just with the transition and everything else. But take it from this angle. How special is Division II basketball here in West Virginia? You have yourself, you have UC, West Live, Fairmont, and all these other schools – but what makes the Mountainese Conference and Division II basketball in this state so unique and special? I think it's the, the brand of basketball that pretty much everybody in our league, you know, is an up-tempo, uh, guard-oriented, um, shoot threes, score points. Um, and so it's a fun style to play, but it's also a really entertaining, fun style of basketball to watch. And so, you know, a lot of times when you watch the Division Ones and it's just, a, you know, it's just a massive slugfest down inside and it's so physical and it's, you know, 65 to 57. And, you know, it's just, I don't know, it, it's, I enjoy, you know, 101 to 99 and, you know, getting it up and down and scoring points more than, than that style of basketball. Okay, so take it from this then. You've obviously seen, as we continue this trend of, your longevity in this conference and just being the coach at state, but you've obviously had to have adapt in some way, shape or form throughout these years. When you look at your game, when you look at your coaching um, career, how have you seen your change the most? Yeah. You know, I think, you know, when I first got here, I mean, everybody wanted a back to the basket post player or, you know, somewhat needed one. Um, and I would say that's the biggest change because we just, we don't implement one of those now, you know, we'll post up a guard or we'll post up pit or whoever to go into the post, but you know, we, we don't have that big body down inside. And, and so I, I think that's one of the biggest changes there was, 
you know, one year where we had Robbie Lewis and David Ford, which was two really good post players. And, you know, if you remember back to that year, and I think it was probably, uh, geez, I don't even remember what year, 2012 maybe or 13. Um, and we completely style, uh, changed our style of play that year just because it fit our, you know, our players. And, and so we m went to more of a high-low offense and really tried to pound it down inside. And so, but outside of that year, you know, we've um, continued our style, which is up tempo and and kind of score with our guards. Um, and honestly, you know, I can remember back to you know 2003, four when I had Ron Donaldson and Mike Taylor was our two lead guards, and both of them could really shoot it. And we ran one of our plays that we still run today, um, which is our elbow action, and get those two guards on one side of the floor with a post player. So you know, yeah, I have changed, but at the same time. In certain ways, you know, you, you, you keep some of the things that, that work well for you. The relationship side, I think, is just something that continues to be discussed, especially with NIL being as prominent and popular it is as, as it has, along with the transfer portal as well. And I'm always fascinated whenever coaches have different answers with this because the relationships have definitely changed. But in your eyes, going into year 24, how has the relationships between a coach and a player developed or even changed for that matter whenever you first took the job? Well, obviously, you know, with technology, I mean, you've, you've, you've got to adapt to that because, um, you know, I remember back in the day, you're, you're making recruiting phone calls at night and, you know, now it's, you know, text messages and, you know, social media, uh, direct messages or what have you. I don't think kids like to talk quite as much on the phone. But and I will say this, though, a lot of our players, when they do, they want to FaceTime. And so I'm not a big FaceTime guy, but, you know, our players like to do that. And so we've even been on some group FaceTimes and Glenn and Jeremiah Moore are overseas now. And they'll FaceTime me and Marcus and, you know, the four of us still be able to talk. Um, so I, I would say that is a little bit of it, you know, just adapting to the means of communication of today's athlete. Um, but I think in the, you know, when you get really, when you really get down to it, it's about the kids knowing and understanding that you care about them more than just a basketball player. And however you get that across to them, then that's, what's going to build your relationship because they want to know that they're more than just a basketball player to you as a coach. Okay. This may seem like a very difficult question, but I'll, I'll just say it in simple terms. Are you for or are you against the transfer portal? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a big question, I guess. Um, and, and somewhat, you know, everybody, the transfer portal and, you know, everybody thinks it's something new, but – and the transfer portal is, but the rules are still pretty much the same with the exception of, you know, we're not allowed to restrict a student athlete who wants to transfer – so in the past, before the transfer portal, at least you're allowed to go anywhere outside of our conference. All right. Well, the NCA, when they put in the transfer portal, they took that, you know, right away from the coaches. So now, you know, Duke cannot keep a player transferring to North Carolina. Um, so that part changed. The part that is still there is, and a lot of people and student athletes don't know this, is you're still only allowed to transfer one time from school to school and, and so after that you're going to need a waiver an exception or you have to graduate and be a grad transfer um you know earlier in the summer or late spring they put up to vote to give kids multiple transfers and the ncaa voted that down which i think was a good thing um because i'm okay with guys leaving you know after the year and, and transferring one time but if we're really about you know these kids getting college degrees and you let them transfer four times in four years of eligibility, what degree is he going to get? I mean, at best, he might get a general studies degree. But, you know, you're probably not even going to be able to get that. So, um, you know, limiting that they're still only allowed to transfer one time unless they get a waiver or they graduate, uh, I think was a good thing. Um, and, you know, I've always told our kids after the season's over, we give them a week, week and a half, then I would sit down with them in an exit interview. And if you want to transfer, here's your release. You can go. I don't have, I don't hold anybody hostage. You know, I don't want people that don't want to be here. Uh, so if they're not happy here for whatever reason, playing time too far away from home, the school, whatever, me, 
whatever it might be. If they want to transfer, here's your release. Go ahead and go. You know, but I just need to know at that point in time, two weeks into it, because don't tell me in July, now you're going to leave and I don't have time to replace you. So uh, the one thing I think with the transfer portal, too, that I think needs to be addressed, I think um, the date that they have to let you know is June the 15th, which I think is too late. Um, you know, our basketball season ends the first week of March. And so, you know, I would think, you know, at least, you know, by the end of April, they should know if they want to transfer or not. Um, which would give us more time to replace the guys. How have you seen the transfer portal either benefit or hurt you all? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think it's been okay. I mean, uh, you know, we got uh, to start out the year, we got two grad transfers and we got two freshmen and we got two junior college transfers. So we kind of got a little bit of of everything. And, and honestly, you know, we just um, – I recruit the best person for the spot and whether that be a freshman, a transfer, a grad transfer, or whatever it might be. Um, and I will say the one thing with the transfer portal and the ability for all these guys to transfer so much is you have to recruit every position. Like everybody's asking me on the recruiting trail, you know, what are you looking for next year? Well, we only have one guy that on paper is leaving and that's, Tavon Horton, a grad transfer from Fairmont Senior High School, uh, transferred in here from Pikeville. However, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen at the end of the year. So you got to recruit every position in case your point guard decides he wants to leave. Um, and so that part of it has kind of changed a little bit. And, you know, every year you got to recruit your player, your own players a little bit um, to keep them there. The ones that you want to keep, you got to recruit them and keep them there. So let's talk about the season now. And you mentioned how you guys made the NCAA tournament last year. You upset West Liberty in the first round as a seven seed. What's your message to your guys this year following a successful season last year, only losing eight games? Yeah, you know, I've been telling them, you know, I want to take the next step. And, um, you know, the next step is getting past that second round. Um, you know, we've been in the NCAA tournament since I've been here six times. And we're five and one in the first round. Um, we lost, I think it was to maybe Virginia Union up at Gannon University. Um, and I don't remember which year that was, 07 maybe. Um, but we've only lost one time in the first round. So five and one in the first round is pretty good. Uh, but then we're 0 and five in the second round. And, you know, we've had some chances where in it, that last year, I mean, we were up on Cal PA by 14, 15 points in the second half. And, momentum switched and they ended up pulling the game out and um same thing happened in um 07 against um barton so that wasn't 07 when we lost first round uh we played barton in the second round and we were up seven with a minute and a half to go in that game and they ended up coming back and beating us and then they went on to win the national championship that year and we had them beat on their home court um so that's our message is you know we're trying to take that next step uh, obviously, I would love to win a Mountain East Conference because, as you alluded to, uh, all of my championships since I've been here with West Virginia State was in the WVIEC. Um, so, you know, that's one of my goals is for our program is to win a Mountain East Championship. Uh, but also, like I say, take that next step. We, we want to get back to the NCAA tournament, but we want to get past that second round, too. Let's talk about two of your guys that you have returning for you. And let's start with a guy that's a friend of this program, a guy that we always talk about, and that's Anthony Pittman, your number two leading scorer last year behind Glenn, uh, Glenn Abram. When you look at Pitt, year four with him, how was he starting to grow and, you know, morph into what you are ultimately wanting him to be? I think he's becoming a better leader. And, you know, he's, he's, he's understanding that, one tone with every one of your teammates doesn't always work. And, and, and so I think he's learning how to deal with different personalities on the team better. Um, and so I, that's his biggest, you know, step this year. Um, but since he's been here, he's become, you know, just an overall much better basketball player which we all knew myself and his high school coach, Matt Green, and, you know, everybody knew once he stopped playing football all fall and, you know, running past patterns and tackling guys and really working on your craft as a basketball player, um, you know, his game was really going to get a lot better, which it has. 
Um, he's shooting the ball really well. Uh, but I think, you know, this year right now, the thing I'm most proud of him is his leadership. And then the other guy I want to talk about is Noah Jenkins, a guy that was a new guy last year for you. He's back for another year. What are you seeing out of Noah? Yeah, Noah, you know, Noah's one of our best shooters. And last year, I think he was our highest three-point field goal percentage shooter. Um, so, you know, that's that's really helps us stretch the floor for 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 Pitt to drive and for Dwayne Jones to get to the rim. And and so um, I think that really is is Noah's it, uh, you know, kind of his little uh, area for us is, is, is a great shooter. Now, he does other things. I mean, I think he's a really good defender also um and wants to take on a defensive challenge um you know he really wanted to guard the kid from glenville last year that was scoring all the points and you know he didn't hold him down he scored his points but he took multiple shots to get those points and so you know we felt like noah did a really good job on him so i think and then uh, rebounding i mean he does a great job rebounding for us as well and you know him having a season under his belt in our system and with me and understanding, you know, what I'm doing and where I'm coming from uh, has certainly helped him as well. So we expect a big year out of him this year for sure. And then the last guy I want to talk about before I let you go is Tavon Horton, as you mentioned already, a, a Pikeville transfer, started his career at West Virginia University, a Fairmont native. What, what do you see from Tavon that could really help your team this year? Experience, leadership, toughness defensive just savvy and and just you know that that's what he brings for us I mean yeah he could he can put the ball in the basket and he's gonna get you know a lot of offensive rebounds for us and all those things but you know his, his just experience of being in all those different programs and and then you know he's been out of high school for five years now um and then he's a physical tough defender um that, you know, I think is going to be kind of a glue guy for us. Um, doesn't necessarily need the ball, want the ball or anything like that. Moves without the ball and can score without the ball. Um, you know, I, I like I said, I think he's going to really be our glue guy. You're going to see the the wild moments that Pitt gives you and, and the shots that Noah makes and Malik Whitaker that we haven't talked about yet is a very good player that could do a lot of things. But then at the end of the day, I think, you're going to look back and say, but remember that play Tavon made. Remember Tavon got that loose ball. Remember Tavon got that big stop on that kid. That's what really helped us win. And so I think that's really what he's going to do for us. And then finally, talk about Malik, a guy that's transferring in, NJCAA player for you, Juco transfer. Um, when you look at him, what part of his game excites you the most? Well, I tell you, he's just an overall, just a, a very good player just an overall very good player I've I've said you know multiple times I mean you know Pitt gives you that wow oh my gosh play uh but then sometimes Pitt will do some crazy stuff and you'll go like oh my gosh what's he doing um and Malik won't give you either one of those I mean he won't just wow you with a crazy athletic play but he's more solid and is not going to make some you know careless turnovers um he shoots the ball really well He's close to Pitt's athleticism, but, you know, it's hard to be as athletic as Pitt. Um, but, you know, I think uh, Malik's going to block a lot of shots. He's got good timing around the rim. Uh, he's long. He's athletic. He can put the ball on the floor. Uh, he can pass it. And um, he's just a great individual to be around, too. I mean, he's he's just always in a good mood. And um, I really pleased him and, and had him more to you, but we'll – We'll make it the team if we got it. Well, Coach Poor, thank you for your time. It was a pleasure speaking with you, and good luck this season as the Yellow Jackets get ready for the 22-23 season. Absolutely. Thanks for me on. Yep, absolutely. Up next, head coach Daniel Mondragon from El Davis and Elkins University. Up next here on the Canal Valley. Up next on Hoops Across the Mountain State. Well, I think among all of the podcast episodes and interviews that I've done, this is certainly a first. Now, for people that are watching, you'll know what I'm talking about. But for people that are listening, eh, you probably need to go to YouTube. Go, just go look up Hoops Across, Across the Mountain State. Go to the end of the podcast for the part three of the MEC preview series. And you'll see that my guest right now, head coach Todd May from Concord University, is currently sitting in a Chipotle, which I'm fine with because 
you know, I'm not great. I'm a Cordoba guy, but I'm starting to go right. back towards Chipotle. But hey, my man, my man, Coach May here. He's just a man of the people, like he said before. He's he's doing everything he can. Coach, how are you? Good. I'm doing well, Taylor. I appreciate you. Like I said, if you want to get this done, we'll knock it out. We, uh, my wife and I, were actually in Morgantown earlier today. Uh, she had a follow up uh, from a surgery she had back in late July. Uh, got great news today. Everything's good. And uh, we actually went back to our hometown. Uh, Circleville, Ohio has a fall festival. Uh, so we went back there, saw some friends and family, and we're actually headed back to West Virginia. This was our day off and uh, headed back for practice tomorrow. And uh, you said, let's do this. So we're going to knock it out here. Uh, Chillicothe, Ohio, Chipotle, get it done. Well, I appreciate that, Coach. Well, let's start there. What, what do you get when you go to Chipotle? Are you a big bowl guy, burrito guy? What are we talking I'm a bowl guy. Definitely go with the chicken bowl, um, sour cream, lettuce, cheese, and kind of mix it up on the uh, salsa. But uh, definitely love my, my chicken bowls. I'm, I'm right there with you. Maybe not the sour cream, but I like everything else you mentioned. Strong, Got per usual. Yep. I like it. So, so like, Cadoba's out of the question then? Never had Cadoba. I think I, maybe once time but like i said always if i can get to a chipotle we try to try to make that happen my wife's a big fan of it as well well this is the end of hoops across the mountains today we just finished with no i'm just kidding um but anyway <laughs> I mean, we're here to talk hoops not food i mean like we can yeah. talk food forever but um but coach let's let's talk about your season this year you're you're entering the next season with you all 22 23 season with concord but when you look at last year you guys Played in 12 games, decided by five points or less, and you guys went seven and five during that stretch, but you guys ultimately finished up 14 and 15, 11 11 in the MEC. So, my first question to you is, Coach, you guys were preseason ranked sixth in the MEC. What has to happen for you all to get over that hump and be one of those top three, four teams in the league to compete consistently for a title? Well, I think the number one thing, Taylor, is we've got to be healthy. Uh, I think that was the thing last year that really deterred us from uh, being what we could have been. Uh, we were beat up the entire season. And I think you look back, and once we got to late February, uh, I'm sorry, well, mid-February, uh, late February is when we kind of got hot, and that's when everybody got healthy. I mean, you look back, and you know, at one point, Matt Weir had mono, Ethan Heller had mono, Davion Moore missed significant time with a groin injury. Um, I'm trying to think. Jaguar Jackson played two games for us, uh, had a had a uh, Achilles issue. So just getting healthy and getting everybody out there uh, is, is going to be key for us. And we've had a really good fall, you know, a couple of nicks here and there. But, um, you know, we started uh, Saturday and had, you know, our whole roster uh, healthy and getting after it. And uh, I think that's going to be the key for us to stay healthy this year. So when you look at being healthy, is there a specific message to your guys? Because obviously you can't control an injury, but yeah. there has to be something to let them know that if we want to be an elite team, then we have to really, really watch ourselves in regards to what we do on the court during a game. Yeah, just taking care of our bodies. And that was the main thing I talked a lot with our guys about this fall is just, you know, making sure we get enough rest, make sure we get proper hydration, make sure we get proper calories, you know, after a workout, just to make sure that, um, like I said, a lot of the things last year that happened were just out of our control. And, um, you know, those things, those guys don't mean for those things to happen, but obviously they did. And um, like I said, they've done a really good job of, of staying healthy here this fall and hopefully that continues moving forward for us. When you look at your schedule, difficult schedule to start off with. You guys are playing your first two games in Clarion, including playing the Division II National semifinalist in Indiana, Pennsylvania. When you look at these first stretch of games leading into the bulk of your conference schedule, what do you want to learn during that stretch about your team? Yeah, I mean, we've always tried to schedule tough. Um, usually we go up to IUP and play them in their tournament, and they weren't able to do that this year. Just had a lot going on at IUP, so Clarion decided to host that. So we'll open up IUP and play Clarion, and then turn around two days later and play Bluefield State at Bluefield State, which is always a very highly contested game. Uh, they end up getting easier as we open up with Charleston and uh, West Virginia State and we get the Mountain East. So uh, we'll find out real early where we are as a team. Uh, we've only got one scrimmage, which is coming up this Friday uh, against Ryder Grand. And we've got two Division One exhibitions wrapped around Christmas. So, um, you know, we're going to 
we're going to find out real soon here, you know, in a couple of days with Ryo where exactly we're at, some things we need to work on, get it better at. Uh, and then with that challenging schedule, like I said, um, you know, last year I probably overscheduled uh, early on because, I, you know, just that's the way we'd always done it. And uh, we had a lot of new guys that were trying to get acclimated to how we did things at Concord. And then those injuries hit in. It was just a little bit of a rough start. Like I said, once we got things rolling there, uh, late January, middle of February, we were pretty good. Uh, but like I said, with our schedule, like I said, you know, we're going to play a challenging schedule. We're going to figure out where we're at early and we'll adjust from there. Along those lines, take it instead of the game, take it from your overall team. What are you starting to learn about this year's Concord team? Uh, you know, just as, as we've always been, uh, a highly, highly competitive group. Uh, and I think that starts with our leadership. Uh, we've got six guys that started at some point last year. You look at Ethan Heller, Jordan Wooden, Daniel Rahama, Javon Layler, uh, Amari Smith, and Davion Moore. All six of those guys started, you know, throughout the year just with injuries and different things there. But uh, to have that experience back, uh, that was huge for us. Um, and like I said, this group that we've brought in and the, and the guys that we've added to our roster, along with those returners, very, very competitive group, probably my deepest group. Um, you know, I look at where we are now on October 18th, uh, you know, probably 11 to 12 guys that could be in the mix for us. Uh, there's definitely going to be some battles for those uh, second spots at our center position with our second team, uh, our four man between Javon and Amari. And in our backup point guard, we have two freshmen that have been very, very competitive. So probably the most competitive team I've had and probably one of the bigger teams I've had. That was one thing we didn't have a lot of size last year. So we went out, we added Renee Diop, who's 6'8", with a 7'2 wingspan. We caught Acott Ager, who's 6'8", Division One transfer. Uh, Aiden Ince at 6'6", um, was able to add some length. And then J.J. Harper is a junior college transfer. We added at 6'5". So wanted to add length and athleticism as well as some size, and I feel we were able to do that myself and Coach Howard. One of the things that really pops out to me is the fact that you're returning 71% of your scoring from last year, and it seems like this will be one of your deeper teams in regards to offense. When you have such a high percentage of your productivity from last year returning for another year, what does this mean for you guys either schematically or even systematically in regards to X's and O's? Well, you know, we do what we do. You know, we're a ball screen team. Everybody knows that. I'm not sharing any secrets or anything. Everybody scouts us and they know. Um, but when you lose a guy like Matt Weir, who's over playing professionally in Luxembourg, uh, he did a lot of good things for us. Um, and you know, I was really, really excited going into last year having him and Ethan. And then, you know, Ethan gets hit um, not only with mono, but he had uh, COVID. Uh, and then you throw in the mix, he's a type 1 diabetic. Uh, he had a very, very rough year. And uh, finally, probably out of the last three or four games, he got back to what his normal self was. Um, and, you know, he, he had a good end of the season, but it was rough for him there from about mid-November to about late January. Um, but, you know, he's healthy now. He has had a tremendous fall. He's now a married man. So he is, uh, he's very comfortable uh, with everything he's doing. He is taking on a greater leadership role. Um, and I'm really, really excited to see, you know, what we're going to have here with him this year. Uh, and then Daniel Rahama is another one that stepped up with the leadership role. I mean, you know, we thought DR was only going to have a year with us. And then, you know, afterwards we did some research. We got the, we got the COVID year back where Virginia State didn't play his senior year. So get him back, second leading scorer, leading rebounder. Really, really excited for this group. But, uh, you know, I think it's just the leadership component for those guys is going to be huge for us. Now, Coach, I'm going to I'm gonna hype you up. And I'm not trying to pat you on the <laughs> back at all. But one of the things that I really love about what you do down at Concord is the fact that regardless of the situation, regardless of the game, I know two things. One, your team's going to come ready to play. But two, your group is going to be very resilient in regards to just making sure that they are not only prepared for it, both physically and emotionally, but also the fact that they are ready for the challenge. So talk about that resiliency with your group. This has definitely been a, a theme for you as a coach at Concord. Just address that if you could. It goes back to our mantra for our program, and that's GRIT. And I started that uh, when I got the job seven years ago. Uh, it's an acronym. stands for Growth, Resiliency, Intensity, and Toughness. And obviously, the growth component, you know, obviously, we get these guys as 17, 18-year-old kids. And, you know, my job is partly to make sure when they leave us here at Concord that they have grown into young men that are ready to head out into the world. Uh, resiliency, I think that's just something that, 
Um, you know, I, I've dealt with a lot of uh, tough things in my life, and I won't get into too many details, but just had, you know, growing up and, and losing my mom 11 years ago and just circumstances throughout my life, I've had to be very resilient. So I hope that my guys never have to go through that. But if they do, I want to make sure they're prepared for it. So I try to make sure I prepare, prepare them from that resiliency side. And then obviously the intensity, we just try to make sure we do things at a high level every day. And then the toughness piece, I mean, this all kind of all fits together. But you see a lot of things with I put out on social media with the grit mentality uh, and grit just being part of our program. And it's just something we preach to our guys every single day. And, uh, you know, hopefully our guys live that. And like I said, that's good to hear from you guys and from other people that that, that shows out on the court when our guys are putting the product out there on the floor. Okay, let's talk about a few of your guys returning, and let's start with a guy that you keep mentioning. That's Daniel Rahama, who was your leading scorer coming back another season. He averaged 15 points a game a season ago, shooting 47% from the field. Having a guy like him back, you mentioned the leadership role, but from an X's and O's and execution standpoint, how important is it for him to be back? Well, you know, with Daniel, like I said, um, you know, he, he was a guy that we got last year, and he kind of, you know, took him – like most transfers, it takes a little bit to understand how we do things and how we operate there at Concord and what my demands are. And he did a great job of picking up on it, um, you know, but it was new to him. It was different than what he had dealt with the last three years at Virginia State. Um, you know, he dealt with a little bit of a knee injury there about halfway through the season, missed about three, three and a half games. Uh, but I thought he was really, really good for us. And like I said, I mean, we went through the whole deal, senior day, everything. We were, we were getting ready to send him on. And uh, when we got the news that he was coming back, that was one less guy I had to recruit, but it made me very happy as a coach because I knew the steps that he had taken and the work, hard work he had put in. I mean, he's a grad student. He's going to finish with his master's after this year, and he's a guy that is just lives in the gym. I mean, he, he's a pro now as a college kid because, like I said, all of his master's are online. He's in our health promotions program, and he lives in the gym. And the best thing about him is not only does he live in there, but he brings a lot of guys with him. And uh, he's, he's kind of our vocal leader, um, you know, having a year in the program, understanding what I want, what Coach Howard wants, what we want as a program, uh, that's huge for us. And uh, I'm really, really excited. He, he had a really, really good summer. He's had a great fall. Um, like I said, with the addition of J.J. Harper, is a guy that every day those two are competing, those two are getting after it. And it just raises the level, as we say, iron sharpens iron. And uh, I'm really expecting a big year from Daniel from just what I've seen here. And, uh, you know, obviously the fall in the first three to four days. Another guy I want to talk about is Amari Smith, a Huntington High product, a guy that we actually talked about last year. We were kind of we were kind of like, okay, just, just show us. Just show us what you're going to do. We knew what you did in high school. You obviously saw what he could do. He started the final 14 games for you all, scoring in double figures in half of those games. So having a guy like Amari back, What's that message to him to make that next leap in his game for you? Well, you know, we talked with Amari there. You know, last year he played out of position. He played a small ball five, very reminiscent of what, let's say, a, a Draymond Green would do. And, you know, it, it was different for him. And just the adjustment of coming from high school to college was a big adjustment. That's why, you know, early on he was trying to figure it out. And then we had an issue with COVID, and we had to start him against Charleston. And uh, I want to say that Charleston game, I think he got up 21 or 22 shots. And, you know, we had to rein him back a little bit, say, Mari, you know, you're going to get those looks, but, you know, you don't have to take that many shots. And uh, he finally figured it out there. We played him at the five the rest of the season there, the last 14 games. And I thought he was, you know, he was in contention for freshman of the year. I thought he had a really, really good year. But it was just that adjustment period of trying to figure out, you know, the difference between high school and college and, you know, playing out of position. He, he, was, he had learned the four, and then we had to play him at the five. He's back to his natural position now, and he's had a really good fall. He's worked on his body. I think he, you know, he's about the same weight as what he was last year, but you can definitely see the difference in him to where he lost a little bit of that baby fat and has put on some more lean muscle, and I think it's helped him. I've noticed he's been more explosive when we do drills and finishing at the rim and doing things like that. So really excited for what Amari's going to do this year. Like I said, still be to, to be determined if he'll come off the bench or he'll start, uh, but, you know, the way I look at it with the group we have, we've essentially have seven starters. I mean, I've got those five guys that all came back. You throw in Amari, and like I said, J.J. Harper's been really, really good this fall for us. So, I'm, you know, I'm rolling with the guys we got. We've got seven starters, I feel like, could play anywhere from 10 to 12. And uh, just really, really excited to get rolling and, and see where we're at Friday when we go play Ryo. And then finally, Ethan Heller, he returns for another year for you. He started – he's played in 70 career games. And he's really, really close from getting to a thousand points, 175 shy of that mark. When you look at him, 
having another dynamic scorer like Ethan, who averaged 10 points a game last season, how, how great is that as a coach to have another good scorer like Ethan back for you? Yeah, like I so said, I was really excited for Ethan after last fall where, where he had gotten to as a player. And then, like I said, he gets hit with mono, he gets hit with COVID. And then, like I said, his, his immune system never really recovered. And, um, you know, I think with Ethan, like I said, the next steps that he took was obviously being a leader for us. Uh, he's a point guard. Um, like I said, him getting married, that I, I tell people all the time, like that was such a special, special thing. Like I've never had a player get married while he was still playing for me. So he gets married to Madison May, who is now the women's assistant uh, there at Concord. And obviously, MEC people will know Madison from her years at Concord. Uh, but they got married, and this is the ceremony, and all of our guys were there. And, and, and I feel like our guys took another step as far as chemistry goes because of that. I mean, when you see a, a friend of yours that takes that big life step to decide to get married and you know, take that leap, um, our whole team was there. Uh, it was a great reception, great wedding. Uh, but I felt like that took us to another level as far as our connectivity and just our togetherness as a program. And the new guys that have come in have just followed suit and bought into that. But yeah, you know, I told Ethan his job's actually going to be a little bit easier this year than it was as a freshman and sophomore. Uh, he won't have to score as much. You know, we, like you said, we've got 71 percent of our offense coming back. Um, you know, he's going to be able to run the offense, get the ball where it needs to go let those guys do a little bit of the scoring. And then obviously, but we have, you know, tremendous, tremendous um, confidence in him and what he can do as a player. We've seen it, you know, a couple of years ago, he had 30, or yeah, I think he had 30 some up at West Virginia State. So he's very capable, but you know, his job primarily is to get the ball where he needs to go. And then we know he's going to make shots. He has shot the ball extremely well in his first three days of practice. Um, so, you know, it, it's good to have that depth. It's good to have that experience. And uh, I'm looking for another big year from Ethan. Like I said, this is a senior year. He'll be back next year for the COVID year. Obviously, being married and massive coach, and he ain't going anywhere for the next two years. So, uh, but I'm, I'm looking for him to stay healthy because I know last year uh, was really the first time in his life as an athlete that he'd had any type of adversity. You know, as a freshman at Sheridan, he comes in, he's a starting point guard, he's a starting quarterback, did that for four years, comes to Concord, he takes Tommy Bolte's place, starting point guard. So, you know, him and I had a lot of discussions about how adversity can help you. And he really, really, you know, tuned into that. And I think that's only going to make him better. Uh, he's been through those tough times now. We, we always talk in our program, whether it's good or not, adversity makes you stronger. And I definitely think it's going to make him stronger as a player. And uh, I'm really, really excited for his uh, you know, fourth year, uh, you know, with us as a senior. And like I said, he'll be graduating in spring as well and then coming back for his fifth year doing his MBA, hopefully. Uh, but just really, really excited for everything to get started here. Well, Coach, thank you for your time. Especially thank you for taking time out of your Chipotle dinner to yep. do this with me. So I appreciate that. But good luck this season. And I'll talk to you here soon, my friend. Taylor, I appreciate it. And I appreciate everything you do for the Mountain East. Like I said, I listened to uh, episode two today with uh, Chris and Steven. And um, oh, who was the third one? Mark. Uh, Yep, Mark. So I had all the West Virginia guys on there. You do a tremendous job, and like I said, we really appreciate everything you do for the Mountain East and looking forward to seeing you along the way. Absolutely, Coach. Thank you so much for your time. Take care, Taylor. Yes, sir. That'll conclude yep. Episode 122 of Hoops Across the Mountain State, our third preview edition of the Mountain East Conference. Follow me on Twitter at Taylor underscore Kennedy 7 for all the latest about this podcast. Subscribe to the podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, and I'll catch you all next week, or the next time, I should say, on the fourth edition of MEC Previews. Thank you all for listening, and stay safe.